be with you. Try it again. The Lord be with you. All right, there is somebody out there. Right. Good to be with you again. Our focus in worship today is uh, when Jesus asked the most important spiritual question. He said, who do you say that I am? That's, that is, that's a very important question to ponder. Who do you say that I am? And uh, when and Peter answered quite well, he had a good reply. But uh, then things changed a little bit, and we'll hear about that in the Gospel lesson. So let's begin our worship as we sing our opening hymn, Jesus, Refuge of the Weary and 423. Upon this, your confession, 
I, by the authority of Jesus Christ, who said, whatever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whatever sins you retain, they are retained. Upon that word of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. freely 
for Christ's sake. It is certain that this is the doctrine of the gospel because Paul clearly teaches, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Now, these men say that people merit the forgiveness of sins by these human celebrations. What else is this than to appoint another justifier, a mediator other than Christ? Paul says to the Galatians, You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. Chapter 5, verse 4. This means, if you hold that by obeying the law you merit righteousness before God, Christ will benefit you nothing. Why do they need Christ who holds that they are righteous by their obeying the law? God has presented Christ with the promise that because of this mediator, and not because of our righteousness, he wishes to be gracious to us. But these men hold that God is reconciled and gracious because of the traditions, not because of Christ. Therefore, they take the honor of the mediator away from Christ. So far as this matter is concerned, there is not any difference between our traditions and Moses' ceremonies. Paul condemns Moses' ceremonies, Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, just as he condemns traditions because they were regarded as works that merit righteousness before God. So the office of Christ and the righteousness of faith were clouded over. With the law and traditions removed, he argues that the forgiveness of sins has been promised not because of our works, but freely because of Christ, if only we receive it through faith. For this promise is not received except through faith. Good words to be reminded of on this uh, Lord's Day. We uh, continue now with the, uh, the readings of the Holy Scripture, the Old Testament lesson, are taken from Genesis chapter 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord, I said Abraham, but it's actually Abram, the name is about to change. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you, throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you, and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Epistle lesson from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, 
We have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. But while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. We stand for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in Mark chapter 8. Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Amen. We confess our Christian faith, using the words of the Nicene Creed, which can be found in your hymnal on page 191. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God, very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, I 
whom all things were made, who for us sent and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was described by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us on the cross of Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have to land. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord who given your life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You see that we sing our sermon hymn when I survey the wonderful cross in the fourth point of time. And there was a lady in the aisle, or, you know, where I was shopping, and, 
And she, she was upset. She said she accused the grocery store of price gouging. Well, sticker shock number one. In uh, 2004, there was a film produced by Mel uh, Gibson called The Passion of the Christ. Did anybody see that film? Anybody? Yeah, quite a few of you did. Yeah, it was very, very popular at the time. You know, that's, uh, boy, that's 20 years ago. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the viewers were, were shocked by the depiction of the suffering uh, of Christ in that uh, in that movie or film, uh, and I can imagine people thinking to themselves when they first saw it, Jesus did that for us. Our salvation can't possibly cost that much. There must be some mistake. Perhaps I could negotiate a better price. There must be some way of getting around paying that. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus reveals uh, God's uh, sticker price, so to speak, for our salvation. The Son of Man must suffer many things, is what Jesus says. And uh, notice what he says, must. There's no way around it. Like the doctor who says to the patient, you've got gangrene, we either amputate or you'll die. It's reminiscent of the time when Jesus said to his two disciples on the road to Emmaus on that first Easter Sunday, it was a question, and why don't you uh, repeat after me what that, what that question was on that Easter Sunday morning. Repeat right after me. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things? Next, Jesus discloses that he must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law. Let's face it, the opposition of the religious establishment, according to Mark's Gospel, has been building for quite some time. When you go home today, uh, take a little time, if you would. It won't take you probably five minutes or so, depending on how fast you read. But read through Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, the entire chapter, and then go all, and then keep going until you get to the end of verse 6 of the next chapter, 3. And uh, in that biblical tour with Jesus, you'll encounter some uh, offenses that took place. People who were offended, well, religious leaders, who were offended by Jesus. Uh, first, the first uh, uh, crime that Jesus uh, committed in their minds was uh, forgiving the sins of a paralytic. Well, since only God could forgive sins, Jesus was uh, uh, committing blasphemy in their, in their minds. Then the scribes and Pharisees were scandalized by Jesus hanging out with such low-life, riff-raff types as he ate with tax collectors and sinners when he called Levi, that is Matthew, to follow him. Next, we're on to number three now, the third offense. The Pharisees are offended that Jesus' disciples aren't fasting like John the Baptist's disciples. Later, Jesus' disciples are caught by the Pharisaical police for the despicably unlawful act of plucking grains of uh, wheat on the Sabbath day, work that was strictly forbidden. And finally, things really come to a head when Jesus brazenly heals a man with a withered hand in public at a synagogue as he confronts the religious leaders who were looking for a way to accuse him. The result of these five consecutive controversies Mark tells us, is this. The Pharisees went out immediately and held counsel with the Herodians against him. Get this. How to destroy him. Next, Jesus says that he must be killed. 
The necessity of death was already made clear all the way back in the Garden of Eden, even before the fall of Adam and Eve into sin. God emphatically warns the first man as if to say, Adam, if you eat that fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it is absolutely necessary and certain that you must die. And St. Paul declares, you, you know this verse, the wages of sin is death. Yeah, yeah there it is. Then Jesus uh, says something that must have fallen like water off a duck's back because the disciples didn't hear this part when he said, and after three days, he, in parentheses, must uh, rise again. The disciples didn't seem to hear that part. All they could hear was this awful, repulsive price that Jesus was saying he must pay. Peter suffered severe sticker shock when Jesus plainly told him and his fellow disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So what does Peter do? He rebukes Jesus. The Greek word for rebuke is the same strong word that Mark uses when Jesus rebukes the evil spirit to be sent out and to cast out demons from the man who was in the synagogue in chapter Mark chapter 1. In Matthew's Gospel, we're given Peter's words, uh, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. While Peter's uh, recognition of Jesus' identity with the words, You are the Christ, was certainly... Uh, admirable and correct, his comprehension and his understanding of the costly price uh, that the Messiah would have to pay, well, Peter was clueless. Peter's refusal and inability to accept the suffering Savior ultimately amounted to a re rejection of God's will to save all human beings through the death and resurrection of his Son. Isaiah the prophet tells us that God's thoughts and God's ways are not our ways. And that's most clearly shown when it comes to God's thoughts and ways of dealing with the problem of sin and humankind's rebellion against him. The crucifixion of Jesus fail, fails to conform to the niceties of human expectations. And what's even more serious is that when we do hear the message that we are forgiven by grace for Christ's sake through faith, we may respond, uh, as this next true story illustrates, in the book, Ragamuffin, The Ragamuffin Gospel, by Brennan Manning, he writes, On a blustery October night in a church outside of Minneapolis, several hundred believers had gathered for a three-day seminar. I began with a one-hour presentation on the gospel of grace and the reality of salvation. Using scripture, story, symbolism, and personal experience, I focused on the total sufficiency of the redeeming work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. The service ended with a song and a prayer, and leaving the church by a side door, the pastor turned to his associate and Fumed. <clears throat> that airhead didn't say one thing about what we have to do to earn our salvation. Self-righteousness is the world's way of thinking. Even as you and I go through the motions of confessing, I, a poor, miserable sinner, nevertheless, often think a tidy, smiling, non-gory helper should be all the Savior we need. It's no wonder then that to counter Peter's denial of the necessity of the cross, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. The very same words that Jesus said to Satan in the wilderness when he was being tempted. Get behind me. Get out of here. Jesus wishes us to, uh, to buy in with uh, no, sticker, no sticker price attached. The shocking price that was necessary has already been paid. The blood of the Son of God is the sufficient paid in full price.
that's already been paid when Jesus declared from the cross, it is finished. It is paid in full. So we get the shocker, uh, sticker shock price number two, and that is what Jesus says next. Would you repeat after me what Jesus says? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Three things, right? Take up the cross, you know, deny self, uh, take up your cross, follow me. Having revealed what it means to be the Christ, Jesus now discloses what it means to be his follower. Jesus goes on to say, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Think about this for a minute. When a young person is being catechized, you know, being taught the small catechism, uh, the pastor, at least some pastors, and it, it varies from place to place, I get that. Not all pastors are the same, and not all churches are the same. But some pastors will require that their uh, young people memorize certain passages of the Bible uh, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe even uh, other things like well, certain parts, certainly certain parts of the small catechism, the six chief parts, memorizing those words. And it's not unusual for a parent to protest uh, to the pastor that such expectations, such demands, such requirements are unwarranted. Now I get it, but not all students can memorize equally. Not everyone has a mind that works that way. So some students struggle with memorization. I get that. And, and it has to be handled sensitively. But, but in the four decades uh, that I served as an active parish pastor, when, when I asked uh, young people on Confirmation Sunday, do you intend to live according to the Word of God and in faith, word, and deed, remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even unto death? Not once did any parent object uh, saying to me, what are you, crazy pastor? You're asking for such an extreme commitment? from my 13, 14 year old son or daughter, my poor baby. Listen, Jesus is not saying that the cost for being his disciple, even if it means martyrdom, is payment for his unconditional love that takes away our sin. That's not the point here. Instead, Jesus calls you and me to respond to his radical love which he demonstrated on the bloody cross and at the vacant tomb by shifting the center of gravity of concern for self to a reckless abandon to God's will for your life. In other words, in Jesus' commitment to go all the way to the cross, you and I find our commitment to him and the gospel. The Holy Spirit empowers us by the gospel to follow what St. Paul says. Would you repeat after me what he says? It's beautiful words. And he died for all, yes. that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Isn't that good news? And you know, what that adds up to, it adds up to something rather shocking. The sticker shock of Jesus' passion is our passion to serve, love, and follow Him and love one another. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
continue to just be offered to him. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we lord and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,